Loving Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the privileges that are ours today to worship you on this, the Sabbath. The Sabbath of the Lord, Saturday. We thank you today for your great truth that nothing will stop. We thank you, Father, for the privileges that are ours to proclaim your truth into all the world. And we pray that you'd continue, Lord, to be with every program, every piece of literature, every brochure, every DVD, with the YouTube, the mass mailings. Lord, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to impress people all over the world. Bless those folk in Colombia, Ishmael, and the group there as they spread the Spanish secret terrorists when the Pope arrives. Bless them. Bless their efforts, Lord, and help your people to stand unflinchingly for what is right and what is true. Though the heavens, though they fall. Lord, bless also those folk out in Texas today. Bless and strengthen each one of them as they go through this Harvey experience. Strengthen each one of them today, Lord. And guide us as we open your word. We pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to us today and rivet our minds upon your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just want to read a couple of promises as we get started this morning. And then we'll get into Naphtali. But Psalms chapter 7 meant a lot to me lately, and I want to share just a couple of promises that are really special. Psalms chapter 7. Uh, Psalms chapter 7, verse 10 and verse 15. Psalms chapter 7, verse 10, it says, My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. And verse 15 says, He made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. Very precious promises for us today. Well, this morning I'd like to go not exactly in order but um, I'd like to pick up another one of Jacob's sons we've looked at Reuben Simeon Levi Judah and now this morning number five will be Naphtali and the Bible calls Naphtali the hind the hind let loose so let's take a look at this hind this morning. Actually, like many of Jacob's boys, there's not a whole lot of information about Naphtali, but we'll gather all that we can and put it together. Naphtali was the second son of Rachel via her handmaid Bilhah. Rachel, watching Leah pop out children like popcorn, became desperate. I mean, you know, Leah's just one after another. It was Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. And then Rachel was getting real upset. So Rachel turned to her handmaid and said, Jacob, you take her as a, another wife. And so Bilhah became that person. Rachel wasn't having a single child. Her frustration knew no bounds. In this struggle, she devised a plan whereby she might have a child vicariously. Made little difference to her. Now the number of competing wives would be three and soon four as Leah would give her maid to Jacob as well. What a mess. 
what a mess. The 144,000 would emerge from this family in the end. It's so encouraging to me to study these sons of Jacob to realize that God didn't take a perfect family. God didn't take perfect people. He took probably the, the most pathetic family in the universe, in the world, but did something marvelous through them. And so it's so encouraging to me to see these names, to recognize Reuben did a lot of dumb things, and so did Simeon, and so did Judah, and so did Levi. But that didn't stop the Lord from saying, I love you. I have great plans for you. And through my power, you will do great things. And so every time I look at these boys, that's what comes to mind. That's what comes to mind. Well, the Bible says in Genesis 30, verses 4 to 8, she gave him Bilhah, Rachel gave him Bilhah, her handmaid to wife, Jacob went into her. Bilhah conceived, bare Jacob a son. Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore called she his name Dan. We'll look at Dan soon. Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. She called his name Naphtali. So Naphtali simply meant wrestling. Now you know, folk, I did a little bit of wrestling when I was in junior high school. I'd like to forget about it, actually. But I'll tell you, when you get into a wrestling match with somebody, it's a dog-eat-dog, dog, tear-off-your-head, you know, situation. And so just that one word that Rachel used there, I have wrestled with my sister, that really paints a, a big picture as to the, the pain. Wrestling is a very painful situation. You can get seriously hurt in wrestling. And so Rachel and Leah were tangling. Even though Rachel was the beloved wife, the fact that she couldn't have children brought such stress and pain into that home. So Naphtali meant wrestling. Nothing more. Nothing more is said about Naphtali until Jacob's benediction in Genesis 49. Nothing specifically. Of course, Naphtali was part of the wicked fiasco when Joseph was sold as a slave. We know that. We know, too, that Naphtali simply did as he was told by the other more influential brothers, Reuben, Simeon, and Judah. So Naphtali, at least in the story of Joseph, he was a follower. He did whatever the big boys said to do. They said jump. Naphtali's response would be, well, how high? Just like his servant mother Bilhah, he and she did as they were told, regardless of right, principle, or conviction. I mean, come on. Think about Bilhah. Bilhah is a servant. She's doing a good job for Rachel. And Rachel says, Bilhah, you go and be with my husband. Is that right? No, that's not right. That's completely wrong what Bilhah did. But, well, my, Rachel told me to. Well, Bilhah was the same way. And Naphtali was the same way as his mother. The older brothers, Reuben, Simeon, and Judah said, we're selling Joseph as, okay, great, let's do it. That was Naphtali. Didn't have a mind of his own. Didn't do what he knew was right. Just did what everybody else said. We know, too, that Naphtali came to Egypt, and Joseph saw that he, along with the other brothers, had changed. Patriarchs and Prophets 2.30 Joseph was satisfied. He had seen in his brothers the fruits of true repentance. Well, brothers is plural. 
Naphtali was one of them. So over the course of that 22-year period, between the time when they sold their brother and when Benjamin's head was on the block and Judah stood up for him, they had all changed. And because Naphtali's apparent failing centered around him just doing what everyone else said, it appears from this statement that Naphtali learned, I'm not going to do what my brothers tell me. I'm going to do what's right by God's grace. In Jacob's final benediction, he mentioned very little about Naphtali, but what he did say was quite positive and illustrative of a fine man. So Naphtali, while he is, I think, what we would call a minor brother, one that we hear not very much about, but there's a lot of positive and a lot of things good about this man. So Naphtali did repent. And folk, let's face it, with any human being, the central theme to success, the central theme to peace in this life and in the life to come is this word right here. Repentance. Naphtali was sorry for the mistakes he had made and he turned away from them by God's grace and power. So this right here is the key in the lives of all of Jacob's sons and in the lives of everyone who will be among the 144,000. It's a repentance. And folk, the essence of repentance is, is a willingness to admit wrong. Taking individual responsibility for something we've done and not passing the blame off on someone else. You know, I find it fascinating, and I say this out of respect for the office of the Presidency of the United States, it fascinates me in the rhetoric that swirls around us in our world today that the President of the United States never, never takes responsibility for something he has said. You you will not, if past experience can be used as a barometer, you will not hear that man say, I did wrong. He doesn't. Paul? Well, that's a great point, Paul. And, you know, the, the chapter in scripture that shows true repentance is in Psalms chapter 51. Because there were a number of men in scripture that said, I've sinned. But that wasn't enough. It was also a matter of saying, I take full responsibility for what I've done and I want to be different. Well, yeah. Good point, Paul. There was a time in American history when you had men of humility that were willing to acknowledge mistakes, but today you do not have that. Psalms 51, the psalmist in his true repentance said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. For I acknowledge, verse 3, my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So David wasn't passing the buck. He wasn't blaming someone else. He said, it was my fault. I did wrong. 
But David didn't leave it there. He also prayed in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. So it was confession, and it was the desire for power to change. Those were the two keys that earmarked true repentance. True repentance. And Naphtali, from this statement in Patriarchs and Prophets, clearly Naphtali repented truly of his sins, of lacking courage, unwilling to stand for the right. And there was a big change because at the time of the benediction, very interesting, these were Jacob's only words. Genesis 49, verse 21. Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Very interesting, Jacob used animals to describe different ones of his children. Naphtali was a hind. What's a hind? Can somebody tell me? Don't look at this picture, by the way. What is it? What's a hind? It's a female. Yeah, doe. Okay. Very, very instructive as we learn about a female deer or a doe. Can you think of other sons of Jacob? We haven't looked at them yet, so maybe that's not fair to ask the question. But can you think of any other of Jacob's sons that were referred to as some animal? Judah, a lion's whelp, okay? Very good. Anybody else? Can you think of any others? Who's that, Maria? Dan. What was Dan referred to be? Do you remember? A serpent. That's right. Dan was a serpent, by the way. All right. Jacob's youngest boy, Benjamin, was not pictured too kindly by his dad. Under inspiration, he was a raving wolf. We'll look at him soon. And the one other son was called a donkey. Actually, the Bible doesn't use that specific word. Issachar, that's right, or Issachar, yeah. So, and obviously in Jacob using these words of animals, of course, you have to study then the characteristics of the animal to see what he was trying to say. But all of the animals that Jacob referred to are things that those that listen to him would be readily aware of the animal's characteristics. Now, a hind is a female deer or a doe especially a red deer over three years old. Her counterpart, the mature male, is called a stag. In other species of deer, the hind may be referred to as a doe, and the male is a hart or a buck. References to the hind are popular in both literature and science. Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm not... I was not raised to be an animal lover. And so characteristics about animals and what they do, and I didn't have a clue. Not a clue. <laughs> so I did some research. One of the noted characteristics of the hind, but not the heart. Now again, the hind is the female deer. The heart is the male. A female deer is very loyal, extremely loyal to her family, 
to her children. The mother red deer and their children form a family group that lasts until the children mate for themselves. So a hind is very, very family-oriented. Very family-oriented. Uh, even then, young males often have territories that overlap those of their mothers. So even as young male deer grow up and move on, they still will be near their mothers. Biblical writers also noted this loyalty. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, the Bible says, Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be, let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Be thou ravished always with her love. So Solomon compares a wife and he says, be as a loving hind. Be intensely loyal within the marriage relationship. Jeremiah considered this loyalty so amazing that a violation of it would be as remarkable as God's destruction of Jerusalem. Notice this statement. Jeremiah 14.5 The hind also calved in the field. Okay, now notice what happens. The mother deer has, has some babies. Calves in the field. And forsook it. Because... There was no grass. In this context in Jeremiah 14, Jeremiah likens the fact that the hind forsook her baby deer and said the Lord's about to do the same thing to Israel. And so in, comparison, in, in comparing God's withdrawal of his love for his people Jeremiah used the hind to, use, to explain the illustration. He goes on to talk about the sins of Jerusalem that would bring this marvel about. The fact that the hind would desert her young was unheard of. It's unheard of. Deer, female deer, red deer, also noted for finding whatever they need for sustenance not only for themselves, but also for their young. Hearts, male deer come down from the hills to eat from farm crops when food was scarce. This persistence in finding what they need was noted by a psalmist. Psalm 42, 1, as the heart, of course that's the male, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. So again, loyalty, persistence, diligence, characterize both the hind and in this case, the heart. Hinds are also considered very, very agile. The one characteristic, this is from a book called As the Deer by Tim O'Hearn. He said, the one characteristic of the deer, red deer, most noted by biblical writers, is their agility. Isaiah 35, 6, Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Beyond noticing their mere leaping, many writers make reference specifically to the unerring hind's feet. That would include their, okay, their hind feet. In Psalms, 2 Samuel 22, David makes a psalm upon his deliverance from his enemies. It's also in Psalms 18. Verse 34, David says, He maketh my feet like hind's feet, 
and setteth me upon my high places. So hinds were extremely agile. They could climb up rocky, mountainous regions with very sure footing and be able to overcome those tremendous obstacles that stood in their way. So all of these are characteristics, folk, as we're looking at the hind. Many of these characteristics, obviously, the Lord reproduced in Naphtali. After Habakkuk had a vision of God in all his glory, he concluded by asserting God's faithful support. Habakkuk 3.19, The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. So the hind's feet remind us that no matter what the obstacle, God can help us to ascend and to go over and to conquer that obstacle in our way. The heart and the hind don't worry about food or about falling. As we go through our days, we should be like they. Let us pant for God who will plant our feet on the heights. Then we will be as pleasant in aspect as the heart or the hind. These verses are very, very special. I would encourage you to memorize them. In fact, just before Habakkuk, said the Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. Just before that, Habakkuk described, and Ellen White refers to God's people at the end of time and it says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and will set me upon my high places. So folk, memorize Memorize Habakkuk 3, 18 and 19. And remember that God will make our feet like hinds feet and will enable us to walk upon and over difficult paths. Beautiful promises. I love that. Yes. Twelve feet high. An average deer. That I did not, that's amazing. Those are both the hind and the heart? The average deer, the average deer 12 feet high. Wow, that's amazing. The noble characteristics of the hind, very loyal, intensely loyal, very protective, takes care of their family. Serves as a lookout. This was something else that was interesting. The hind, oftentimes when the heart and the young are in an area, it's the hind that is chosen to be the lookout. To be the watchman, if you will. To see if any predators are coming in to maybe attack. It's not the heart. I found that very fascinating because the heart, you'd think, well, they're the one that has the makeup. They've got the horns. They've got the equipment, Cody. But the heart is not the one that's used. It's the hind, the hind. So they are the lookout for unwanted foes, very agile, able to conquer towering difficulties with ease. And, of course, Rita's comment, not only 
do they have the feet to conquer, but the Lord has given them great leaping ability to conquer obstacles. These were characteristics that marked and blessed the tribe of Naphtali, and through them, many others. Of course, folk, all of these characteristics, all of these things came because Naphtali was willing to repent. And the Lord blessed him with these beautiful characteristics that made Naphtali and his generation, succeeding generations a great blessing to many, many people. Now, probably the greatest warrior that was produced by the tribe of Naphtali, does somebody want to guess? Who was the greatest warrior, the greatest hero that was ever produced by the tribe of Naphtali? I'll give you a few clues. God's people had been oppressed by Sisera for 20 years. With his iron chariots, the Israelites quaked before him and his army. The time had come for Israel to be delivered. The first battler in the Vale of Megiddo was soon to be fought. This was the first battle of Megiddo. The Lord called a woman, a prophetess, and a man from Naphtali to lead the armies of the Lord. The woman's name, her name was Deborah. She was both a judge and a prophetess. The man that united with Deborah to drive out the hated Canaanites and Sisera he was from the tribe of Naphtali. Does anybody know his name? Okay. His, Cody? Barak. Very good, Cody. Barak. Baruch was Jeremiah's scribe. Baruch was that. The Bible tells us in Judges 4, verses 4 to 9, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. She dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim. So she was pretty much right there in the uh, central, maybe a little bit northern part of Israel. The children of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and called Barak. And notice where he's from, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh, Naphtali. He was from the tribe of Naphtali. And said to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, go and draw towards Mount Tabor, and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Now, Barak was a little bit nervous. He said to Deborah, If thou wilt go with me, I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee. Notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Very interesting. The Lord used, he used the distinctive characteristics very protective, somebody very loyal somebody who was very agile, somebody who had faith in the power of God, and somebody who would risk their life, not only on behalf of their immediate family,
but on behalf of all the family of Israel. And so the Lord chose a man from the tribe of Naphtali, Barak, to go out in the name of the Lord God of Israel to do battle against Sisera and the Canaanites. When the Lord needed a loyal man to lead his army, he turned to Naphtali. He would, by the grace of the Lord, protect and defend heaven's little ones. Barak would be a hind let loose, going to battle to protect God's children. Not only would Barak stand, but so did the rest of the tribe of Naphtali. Now, folk, here is the Vale of Megiddo in northern Israel. This is the Valley of Megiddo right here. But notice who went with Barak to do battle against Sisera and the armies of the Canaanites. Notice who went. Judges 5, 18 to 20. It says Zebulun, the tribe of Zebulun. They risked their lives for God's people. And Naphtali, there's Naphtali, were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan and Tanak by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. So, folk, it wasn't just Barak, but it was the tribe of Naphtali. They had learned the lessons of their ancestors. They had learned the lessons of their forefather Naphtali. They were willing to go out as a hind let loose to do battle against these wicked heathen of Canaan. Now, I want you to notice in Judges chapter 5, you see, every tribe had a choice. Not everybody went down to fight in that battle. Judges chapter 5, the Bible says, verse 15 and on, it says, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, and also Barak, he was sent on foot into the valley. So Issachar and that tribe went too. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. So they're down in the valley. There's blood being shed. People are dying. What was Reuben doing? Reuben was back in his tent thinking, well, should I go or should I not? See, Reuben had no, there was no decisiveness with Reuben. Going on, the Bible says, verse 17, Gilead abode beyond Jordan. Why did Dan remain in ships? So while Naphtali and Issachar and Zebulun were giving their lives for God's people, Dan was out making big bucks in his shipping operations. It was all with Dan. It was all about making the mighty dollar. Dan was out making big money. Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Asher was out on the Sea of the Mediterranean. They were out having picnics and parties and living it up, while Naphtali and Zebulun and Issachar were down giving their lives for God's people. Amazing. Verse 18, Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. You know, friends, it's, it's very fascinating to me 
Reuben, he wasn't sure. Should I go? Should I not go? Does God want me to give my life? God's people, folks, were, were being destroyed. And Reuben wasn't sure. And Asher and Dan were out living it up, rolling it in. And God's people, God's true people, were in the valley of Megiddo in a battle. In mortal combat, God's people stared down the enemy. Wow, what an incredible thing. Reuben wasn't there. He wasn't sure if it was time to engage the enemy. I mean, how many times do we hear people say that? They say, oh no, if you preach that message, you'll bring on persecution before the time. Baloney. If it's not now time, folks, to engage in battle, we might as well just go out in the Mediterranean and live it up. Just live it up. Paul? Paul? They can't. Deer cannot go backwards. Okay, deer don't back up. They don't walk backwards. They make a commitment and they're gone. Amazing, amazing. The hind let loose made a decision to go down into the valley and meet Sisera and the Canaanite kings and they risked their lives to protect the people of God. Reuben, he wasn't sure. Dan was out on the Mediterranean having a good time. Battle, you say? Dan was having too much fun to get into a battle. Asher remained on the shore counting his riches and worldly advantages. He was too busy making money to engage in the Lord's work. The hind, the hind Naphtali, was giving his life that God's people could be saved. Naphtali's loyalty to the cause of God was unrivaled. It was unrivaled, folks. Simeon wasn't there. Levi wasn't there. Judah wasn't there. Reuben wasn't there. Naphtali was there. And most surely in this story, we want to emulate this man and this tribe. Naphtali was a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Naphtali was on the lookout as one of the Lord's sentinels. Not only was he vigilant in defense of the Lord's heritage, Naphtali... Naphtali knew when to speak and what to say as the Lord's mouthpiece. Like his master, Naphtali spoke the truth, but it was done in a thoughtful and tactful way. Sometimes that is so difficult. <laughs> the Bible says, Naphtali giveth goodly words. Now, folk, even Jesus Christ, the most wonderful man who ever lived, who said things in the kindest, most tactful way, got killed for it. So sometimes not even kindness and tact is good enough. Steps to Christ, page 12, it tells us about how Jesus dealt with people. Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful, kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He spoke the truth, but always in love. He denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice. 
as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He wept over Jerusalem, the city he loved, which refused to receive him the way, the truth, and the life. They had rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with pitying tenderness. His life was one of self-denial and thoughtful care for others. Every soul was precious in his eyes. While he ever bore himself with divine dignity, he bowed with the tenderest regard to every member of the family of God. In all men he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. By the grace of God, the Lord wants us to emulate this, to not be rude, to not give needless pain to a sensitive soul. The Bible says more about the speaking and the words we present. Ecclesiastes 12 says, Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he taught the people knowledge. He gave good heed, sought out, and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. That, was, that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Proverbs 16 the wise in heart shall be called prudent. The sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life to him that has it. The instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bone. land of Naphtali, which is in the northern part of Israel. Here's the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee and the land of Naphtali are synonymous. Jesus grew up in the land of Naphtali, right around the Sea of Galilee. This land of Naphtali saw more of Jesus' miracles than all other places in Israel. It was here that Christ did more healing and more preaching than any other. Because of all the blessings the Lord poured on Naphtali, it would be easy to become complacent. And sometimes complacency breeds indolence and ease. Christ knew the dangers that would come against Naphtali. He sought to shield her in her trials. Naphtali was one of the first tribes to feel the stings of heathen conquests. But Naphtali learned his lessons. He learned his lessons. He repented of his sins. The hind let loose finally learned that the only way to scale the difficult paths in life was through submission to the Lord. Naphtali, the protector, finally realized his only defense was in the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Proverbs 18.10 For these reasons, a gate in the new Jerusalem will carry the name of Naphtali. Praise the Lord. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for being so merciful and patient with all of Jacob's boys. Thank you that you had a special work for Naphtali. And thank you that you patiently worked with him till he gave up on himself and relied upon you. Thank you that you used him in mighty ways. The war at Megiddo, 
Thank you, Lord, that you use them to protect your people. Thank you for your amazing grace that was manifest in his life. Father, I just pray that you would strengthen each one of us today to go forth, to be willing to do your will in the midst of heathenism and insanity and craziness in this world today. Bless us, Lord, with the same spirit that rested upon Naphtali. In Jesus' name, amen.